Hello, my, my, my name is Ajahn Sentuti, and um, I'm living here in uh, Kusala Hermitage in Rolling Stone. And I was asked to to uh, just talk a little bit, bit about Ajahn Brahm because uh, this video is made for his his seventieth uh, seventieth birthday. So it's it's uh, it's a surprise for him, even though he knows what is going on. Uh, he doesn't know the content of uh, the surprise, so so we're just gonna be just talking about Ajahn Brahm and, and uh, you know what he means to us um, as a teacher and as a uh, like a fellow monastic uh, walking the path um, and, um, and yeah, just basically what he's done for for Buddhism in in Perth and around the world. So I met Ajahn Brahma many, many years ago, I think about 19 years now. And the first time I met him, I didn't really know who he was. Uh, my intention really was to find a monastery and just go there and practice. But then, uh, just staying there and, and uh, living there for a while, the one thing that I, I uh, remember is that Ajahn Brahma was a very, like, kind of a uh, relaxed and humorous monk. Because I remember going there and thinking that monastic life is going to be difficult, it's going to be strict, you have to follow all these rule, rules, and you have to be a certain way. Something similar like being in, an, in the army. So when I got there, I was a little bit stressed over it, thinking that I had to act in a certain way. So then when I saw this uh, youngish <laughs> Ajahn Ram of, what is it? 50, like 52 years old, um, he seemed to be joking around, smiling a lot, um, and in, in a sense carefree. And what I learned from that is that you take that kind of attitude and kind of uh, freedom into into your monastic life, and not to be so like strict and hard on yourself, but allow yourself to be and allow the path to work it's like magic naturally so uh, so yeah you know, even uh, so just living with him is a is a blessing one of the things that I really like about Ajahn Brahm is is that he never he never um, he never find any faults with his monks or find any faults with his um, disciple lay disciples I've never seen him scold anybody. I never seen him pull aside anybody to tell them what they were doing wrong. Um, he talks about the non fault finding mind, and uh, he practiced practiced it. And I think that's one of the things that stuck in my mind for a long, long time. You live with a man or a monk, and you felt like you're not being judged. Or you felt like you're not being like controlled, and um, and I think in a sense that made it uh, a lot easier, a lot easier for the monks to live with him for for a long, long time. And that's I think one of the the teachings or principles that that each and every one of us can take into their lives is to not be so judgmental to the people around us, not to be so fault finding and controlling, because if you have these kind of uh, like behaviors and um, intentions, I think you'll be able to create a more like harmonious and smoother world around you. And harmony, peace of mind, is a uh, is like a uh, accelerant for the monastic life or for the Buddhist life to create uh, the conditions um, to allow you to you know walk the Dharma path. In an easier and more light-hearted and happy manner, and it's it's like uh, yeah, and he's uh, I think he's uh, he's the embodiment embodiment of um, of like freedom and, and, and st a still mind. That's the one thing is like the still mind. That's what he taught us over all these years. Is like the meditation, the most one of the most important things of um, monastic life and just life in general. Just giving yourself that time to meditate, and him being a good meditator 
um, he has been able to instruct us on how to get there. And on the other hand, as well as being an inspira- like a, lo- a living inspiration to let us know that, that these things are possible in a human being. doesn't matter where you're from, Sri Lanka, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, or anywhere, Australia. If you have these, like, uh, if you have a body of mind, and then uh, you're able to uh, practice, you're able to meditate, you're able to uh, see the Dhamma yourself. So, yes, I've been a monk for uh, 17 years. Um, I'm happy to call Ajahn my teacher, um, and it's got to the point where uh, I'm kind of old enough to be able to uh, help other people from my experience, however uh, deep or shallow it may be. <laughs> so, so what we'll do now is, uh, is we'll just just give we we'll just do a, um, some meditation, and uh, we're gonna guide you for the first first um, twenty minutes. And then we'll sit quietly for 15. And so I was asked to uh, just talk a little bit about meta meditation. And for this instance, we can can uh, just share share our love and sh- share our warm hearts with um, uh, with Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, just trying to bring up that. It's kind of easy, I think. If you think about um, Arjun Brahm and what he's given us in terms of teaching and guidance over the years, um, with such a person to focus in this meditation, um, I think it's quite easy to to develop a sense of metta, a sense of gratitude, uh, a sense of kindness uh, towards him, and uh, we can just bring that feeling up as we're we're sitting down. So. Uh, you can, we can just start a story in our mind on how we, you know, when we met Ajahn. Like, when was the first time you saw him? Uh, did you go to Dhammaloka to listen to the talks? Or did you find him online? Or did you read about him in the book? Uh, because such human beings, uh, with their wisdom, uh, just you being able to get in contact with him, I think. Uh, on your part, as, as fellow practitioners, fellow Buddhists, uh, there was some sort of good karma there, like huge, huge good karma to be able to meet a, a, a human being like Ajahn Brahm in this life. I think in a day and age where you have so many monks out there, so many Buddhist traditions, uh, so many great teachers, and at the same time, Teachers which are, you know, not so great or or not so practiced or advanced. Um, some of us, you know, we may not meet these kinds of teachers in our life because of the the karma that we have. But for the people who have had the fortune uh, from the karma that they've made in their past life or even this life. Uh, to come across uh, a teacher uh, like Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and we can just think about all the, the great things he has done over the years uh, for Buddhism and how he has helped us uh, by being a guide for our lives and also how he has um, helped us uh, through the meditation practice or even any of us who have had some hard times, uh, he was he has has been there if you asked him. Uh, that's that's one thing um, people say about Ajahn Brahm. Even though um, he's had he lives a very busy life, and uh, sometimes in a monastery, uh, even though you live close by to him. Um, um, sometimes you may feel there isn't the time to connect. But if any of the monks, I think, had a question or had a problem, 
then Najan would always make time for them. He would put aside 10-15 uh, minutes, you can go see him privately, um, and then you can have a chat with him. So he was, uh, he was always there for his monks or for his disciples uh, whenever they needed him. And there's a story about, which is just inspiring, you know, to help me bring up these feelings of metta and, uh, and uh, gratitude towards him. And I just vaguely remember it. He, he was, it's one of the disciples in Singapore and uh, they got sick or cancer or something like that. They'd been in and out of hospital and um, it was coming to the end for them. And I remember Ajahn just getting a phone call from the family or something like that. And, uh, and I think because, you know, they have looked after him, um, he felt like, you know, that is true, you know, if, even for myself or even for the other monastics, uh, we get looked after by our supporters very generously. So we, like in a sense, whenever they need our help, we will drop everything, or we won't, we'll do what we can to help them out. And Anjabram was caught in a situation like this where he had a very close disciple and uh, he just dropped everything in that particular time. Booked a flight to Singapore to go over there to do what he had to do, to talk, to counsel, the person who was dying to be able to do a bit of chanting, give a Dhamma talk, or whatever. He stopped what he had to do, took a flight to Singapore, uh, helped his disciple out, disciple out, and then he returned to, uh, to Perth to uh, just continue his life. So those kinds of actions that, that, um, that he has done throughout his life, is, is, when you look at it, it's quite inspiring. And it teaches us as well to, you know, sometimes we just have to let go of what we want to do. We let go of, like, wanting to sleep in or let go of uh, the, the schedule that we set out by ourselves so we can complete a project or do something. It's to be able to put our, our agendas aside to help other people. Like putting aside what you want to do to make the world around you better. In a sense, you know, we kind of learnt that uh, from Ajahn Brahm. I mean, if you wanted to, you can just stay in a monastery and just meditate all day. He's a great meditator and he can just sit on his bum for hours and hours and be a recluse and be a hermit. But instead, I feel strongly that one of the reasons why he, uh, he travels so much and he teaches so widely is because he knows deep within that he has something something like special like to share uh, with the world around him and it just goes to show how many uh, people's lives he's affected on, on so many different levels you know like from the everyday family person to the uh, the student at school uh, to the struggling parent and even to the monastics. Uh, he has that ability to guide and help people from different walks of life. And you know, there's something to be grateful for, something to reflect on uh, when we're doing this meditation. Because you know, these these talks are basically all about Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and you can just imagine like He'll be sitting back and just watching what other people will have to say about him. Um, I think it will bring him like a sense of like just uh, just a sense of happiness, just to see just to see how much uh, so much he's being loved. <laughs> and I think he knows that like a lot of people do love him, and it's just our way of just showing him. Um, so there's been a lot of efforts as well to be able to make this happen. So what we do now is we'll just uh, we'll just guide you for a little while, and then we can just allow the momentum of meta and happiness to build up, and we'll send it to Ajahn Brahm, send it to yourself, send it to the people um, in your lives, or whoever you want to send that meta to.
to get the body so comfortable that you don't have to move it too much. Meditation is not about sitting through pain. But meditation is about sitting in comfort. Because when the body is comfortable, then it's one less distraction for the mind. And because it's the distractions of the past and the future, the distractions of a pain, painful sensation in the body. These things, they take away the peace of the mind. So we just get ourselves comfortable and we just place our mind into the moment, into this present moment. What you can do is just take a couple of breaths, just watch the in and out breath for the first couple of minutes. We're just allowing our minds to settle down and when we meditate it's always nice to give the mind a little bit of direction so the direction that we are going towards is having gratitude, having metta, loving kindness, just good feelings towards Arjun Brown. Just think about how he came into your life and how he has influenced it and how he has changed it.
And it's, it's like easy to love somebody who, who has helped you so much in your life. So we can just see if we can picture as you're brown in our minds. You can try to picture his wonky teeth. Picture the glasses that he wears. Picture how his robes are not always fully on and kind of falling off his, his uh, shoulders. Just a Caucasian man from England. A smart man. What is it? Uh, theoretical physicist won a scholarship to go to Cambridge. Okay. Just picture Andrew Brown. Whenever you've seen him on YouTube, just sitting down with a microphone in front of him, giving a talk to people. So we're just trying to get an image of him in our minds. Just whatever you can use to trigger a memory. You can imagine the way he laughs after he cracks a joke. You know, how he laughs at his own jokes while he's giving a dumb talk. So what we're trying to do is just try to get an image of Arjun Brown into our minds. Once we have him in our minds, we can be, start off by just having a sense of appreciation for how he's affected our lives.
to maybe think to yourself a time, a story where Ajahn Brahm's teachings, how he's inspired you. Just see if you can bring a memory into your mind and allow those and see if you can draw out any positive emotions from them. As we're doing this, we're always meditating in the present moment. Now we can just send well wishes towards Sachin Brahm. We can wish him good health. We can wish him long life. We can wish him to be free from any tiredness. We can wish him happiness. Probably don't really need to wish him happiness. He's happy enough himself. We just just send some good wishes to him. He's not getting any more younger. He's getting older. His body's sl- his energy levels aren't as high as they used to be. So in a sense we can just wish the best for him. Because we care for him. We want him to live peacefully. We want him to be happy. So now we're just going to sit quietly and then we can end the meditation.
we take. So we can uh, just finish off the meditation. And I was always asked to uh, just to just say a few words on on how to how to just just like reflecting on on the meditation that's gone by and um, just just seeing just seeing like the mind just going into a peaceful place um, just being able to just focus on metta and and just giving it to our teacher or even just being in the present moment or doing the breath meditation um, our minds can just go to a place where it's nothing much is happening there's a lack of distractions there's a lack of worry because our mind has found a quiet place to hang out in hanging out with the thoughts of loving kindness towards our teacher or just hanging out with just being in the present moment or hanging out just watching the breath just doing these like simple tasks has a positive effect on our minds. It's sort of like taking our minds for a bushwalk in the forest of peace and happiness. And when our minds are awake and busy and busy doing things, that's like taking our minds for a walk like on the internet with all the things that you can do um, and you can also take that from a physical aspect when you think about just people living busy lives just walking through the city going into the offices on the computers doing this kind of work and doing that kind of work just imagine all the um, the, uh, the business that you're putting into your mind and when you take your mind when you take your body and mind out of the city and go into the forest, or go to a park, or go for just going for a walk in a peaceful environment. You can see how that calms you down. And I think in the same way, um, meditation is like taking our minds from all the information that we can get into this that we can get in this world. Uh, meditation is stepping away from that and just being able to take our minds for a walk um, in a place where we can find peace and happiness. So when we're reflecting on why we meditate, I think this is the reason why we do it, is to be able to just give our minds a bit of a bit of, a little bit of peace, a little bit of inner happiness. And the practice of meditation is about just practice, like I said, practice. Just keep on repeating it and keep on doing it every day. And the momentum of peace and the momentum of inner happiness just builds and builds and builds uh, to a point where, where um, meditation becomes like second nature. And meditation becomes like like a necessity to uh, to give yourself a sense of like uh, peace in your life. <coughs> so yeah, we're just here to like today is just to learn a bit about meditation, thinking about our teacher, and and. Uh, and celebrating his 70th birthday. <laughs> <laughs>